January 2nd, 2019. This is Everyday Truth. Um, I want to start today by saying that yesterday morning I experienced in, um, in action um, acknowledging myself for how much progress I had made just during this past year, 2018, uh, the deepening of experience that I had by just diving into um, trainings and experience as a client in psychodrama and drama therapy techniques and just learning about a whole new world of amazing ways of moving, um, moving the needle on this recovery process and recovering recovering the ability to feel um, without fear, feel real emotions without fear. And it occurs to me that so much of quote unquote spiritual journeying and practice is about trying to find some escape route from the inconvenience and discomfort of being human, of being in a human body, living a human life, and experiencing what our mind does in response to our expectations. So I've, I've had my own um, battle with this because spirituality or this sort of other route was sold to me very attractively right at a point in my life when I wasn't able to come up with answers from my own toolbox at that point. The first 35 years of my life didn't give me anything to deal with the kind of um, dissolving that I was experiencing in my worldview um, and my self-concept, my self-identity and what I hinged everything on. And um, now I can look back and call that perfectionism, that I, that I hinged my identity on being perfect. And it's still something that I wrestle with. Um, my high standards are always lurking and tapping me on the shoulder and telling me that I could do better. And um, there's a useful aspect of that, which is aspiration. And then there's a lot of unuseful things, especially when it comes to creating and discovering and um, kind of just stepping into new territory and finding a voice and experimentation. Um, so I made a lot of progress in accessing feelings and accessing truth. And it's led me to this point right now where I'm finding a healthy daily practice for myself of touching in with the truth as it is in this moment and learning how to um, understand my own avoidance of my feelings as well as just embrace what I'm feeling, whether it's convenient and comfortable for others and me or not. And I think that's really at the core um, of the true teachings of the, the original Buddha which, um, as I learned them as interpreted during a Vipassana meditation retreat, the two essential teachings of the Buddha were um, bring your awareness to your bodily sensations. So the body, the, the, the mind's relationship with the body is the vehicle toward all of this realization and enlightenment about how things really operate but becoming the observer of the mind in a body, which is much easier said than done, and you know, has resulted in volumes and volumes of writing. But fundamentally, it's becoming the observer of a mind in a body. That's teaching number one. So I called, after I kind of understood that, it's like I, I understood and took Buddha to be the first somatic psychologist. And the second teaching is, don't take my word for it. Don't just believe me. Have your own experience. 
and do not worship me, in the words of Buddha. So Buddha didn't want to become a religion. He didn't want to become a god or a guru. He was pointing to an experience that was fundamentally human and believed could happen in every single human mind and body. And unfortunately, those two teachings have completely disappeared from all of the, quote, Eastern spiritual um, things being taught in the West because those two things are extremely difficult for the typical Western mind to be in the body with the mind, to observe that there is a mind in a body and not to be identified with whatever the mind is experiencing as reality. Um, so just, just that concept of being an observer of a mind in a body so that our, so it's very popular to say that our entire reality is created by thoughts. There's a, an aspect of our reality that's created by our thoughts, but we also have a bodily reality. And we don't have a very good vocabulary for that, that experience in our culture. And then the second aspect of not turning it into a religion, <laughs> it seems like the entire human condition is like really bad at that, at not turning things into religions, <clears throat> that we seem to somehow start worshiping everything as soon as it uh, comes out. So, um, <clears throat> I wanted to just note for myself that progress um, is progress. And that tendency for me to um, always be that perfectionist <clears throat> and sort of run that tape is getting is getting less in my mind, but it's not gone and that's okay and I don't know that the goal is for it to be gone but rather to just um, live in a kinder more balanced relationship with that tendency to want things a certain way it's not all bad it's just sort of deciding and discerning when is it serving me in the situation and when have I taken it too far which brings me to Mommy Dearest, which I talked about in yesterday's video because I watched it New Year's Eve. And I talked about the scene that I had seen when I was eight. But overall, if you look at the abuse of that um, mother, as portrayed in the movie, I've not read the book yet. Um, the abuse was just not knowing how to love another person truly. And if you look at the mother's own childhood was completely devoid of love, which drove her to be the ambitious person that made her into the star that she was and gave her the wealth that she had. And then, as depicted in the movie, she just wanted that last thing to fill, you know, fulfill her entire list of dreams in life. And that was to have children and be able to give them what she never had. But at the same time, so there's this conflicting thing about wanting to give them everything she didn't have, purportedly wealth and love, but also at the same time wanting to validate herself by saying, look at how far I got based on what I didn't have, based on how tough my life was and how I had to fight for everything I got. I have to give you that gift also. So there are these scenes where... Um, they would get all these birthday presents. And apparently this was true where they got all these gifts and she would let her kids only choose one and then donate the rest to charity and write thank you notes for all the gifts. And, um, and where she, there's a scene where she's competing with her daughter at a young age, like under 10 years old, like competing with her swimming in the pool and just um, getting her to the point of exhaustion. And, and then when her daughter gets mad, saying, like, I did my best, you're just bigger than me. Um, and she gets no sympathy from the mother, like, I'm bigger than you, I'll always beat you, and that's how the world is. And then the daughter's saying, like, fine, then I don't ever want to compete against you again. And then the response to that is rage and saying, okay, I'm going to lock you in this room until I decide you can come out. <laughs> Which, that's my defensive laugh defending 
extreme feelings of emotional flashback to unfair treatment as a child, being locked in places as a way to lock my ability to feel out of sight of a parent who can't deal with her own ability to not feel. Um, so the abuses, these were sort of like, you know, I understand them now as little tiny vignettes of accumulation of a lifetime of, of accumulated uh, insults and injuries that add up to abuse and trauma. But if you just sort of tell these little stories here and there, people can shrug and say, meh, you know, I had a harsh mom too and it did me good. Which brings me to the main subject that I wanted to speak about today, which is a question someone who read my Facebook post from the other day um, asked you know, in response to, wow, this is really getting me to think about why I deny the abuse that I endured. Why do I continue to protect my abusers? Many, many reasons. So I'm not going to provide answers, I'm, it, but it's a great question to ask if you're asking it yourself. When I'm speaking about emotional, verbal abuse, um, total or neglect, which means um, when I hear the word neglect, I often like picture starving children somewhere that are living alone in the streets. Um, and this, the emotional neglect that I'm talking about is like, actually is invisible. You don't look like you're starving, but it's like, again, the cumulative effect of being dismissed ignored and invalidated or negated. So for example, were you often interrupted in the middle of speaking an idea? Were you interrupted with the word no, 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 it wasn't that bad. No, come on, don't think like that. Don't say that. Were you often, um, told to stop crying, stop yelling, stop doing whatever when you were validly expressing an emotion in response to something. Um, so if, if these were consistently things that happened to you and you did not have a strong muscle of rebellion, then it's likely that the trauma of all of that was from neglect of yourself. Like, like that invalidation from the outside became something you believed and took on and began to treat yourself um, in that way. And so that is often, since that's the symptom that we treat ourselves that way, that that's the layer that we often treat the first, like the inner critic, the perfectionist, the person that blames yourself, that we start there. But if we never actually look at where we learned that behavior from and how that learned response was actually um, something protective that your nervous system did at the time to protect you from further annihilation, we can take it all on ourselves and never realize that our inner critic, our self-neglect, our self-abuse came from a learned response to our environment. And that applies to everyone in the entire chain of intergenerational trauma. How far back can you go with your healing? It has been said to me, and I have not yet verified with personal experience, but I, I am believing this, I'm holding faith in this idea, that when we really heal 
that trauma, abuse, and neglect in ourselves that we heal seven generations back. But think about how deeply we have to go to understand the origins, to feel into the origins of our behavior and how far back it goes to do that healing. We have to go deep. We cannot do it by denying that there was any other person involved. We can't do it by protecting others by taking on their shame as our own and keeping it personal. And we can't keep it while maintaining loyalties to the tribe that created that line and lineage of secrecy and trauma. So, yes, it's daunting because we actually have a built-in safety valve that's, that's based on fear of annihilation that was developed early in life before we were even able to speak that um, that we developed because we depended on these big people in our lives. We depended on adults to take care of us up until a certain age. So from infancy through toddlerhood, we were completely dependent. And for much of our childhood also, completely dependent. We were not able to just, thanks to child labor laws, <laughs> we weren't able to just go out and earn our own living and buy our own food and shelter. We did have to depend on these adults. So they did provide for us, and some of them knew that because we were dependent on them, we had no recourse when they lost control of their own emotions and took it out on us. They also had nowhere to go to deal with their own feelings of shame, if they had them, about treating us that way. So... Since there was nowhere for it to go, it had to stay locked inside the walls of that unit, whether it was a family, a school, a religious community, or whatever. That shame had nowhere to be released, so it had to be spread and locked in among all the participating members of that unit. So that's how it propagates. It stays locked in place, and everyone keeps carrying it on generation after generation, never questioning it. And it's fear. The fear just increases with the secrecy. So um, as long as we stay loyal to that shame-bound tribe and believe the lies that include um, you'll, no one will support you if you leave us. No one will believe you. Um, you can't trust anyone except your tribe. Um, no one will, will ever love you like your tribe loves you. All of these lies that keep our minds in fear and shrunken down inside the walls of the tribe. Even if we've had this, um, even if we had the, the opportunity to like peek out a window at the, at the world around us, um, with our minds still locked in to these loyalties to the tribe, we can't fully trust in what we've seen in the outside world, even if, it's, if we've seen it with our own eyes. We still have a voice inside us that's saying, it's not for you. It doesn't belong to you. And it, those are the voices of shame because they have to keep a, a wall and a network around them to stay alive. So everything that I'm speaking right now is chipping away at that shame matrix, the one that I'm locked into, that I have been locked into, but I'm in the, in the process of dismantling and dissolving. And I know what I'm talking about in specific when I speak. I'm not reading out of any book. Um, sometimes I'm naming those specific lies, but often I'm not, and I'm inviting whoever's listening to this, to do that excavation yourself. What are those lies that you're holding on to and the secrets that you're keeping for others that require you not to see the possibilities that you know are in the world, that you may have actually seen with your own eyes, 
but you cannot trust and believe and act on them unless you betrayed your loyalties to the tribe. So some of the most inspiring stories that I've read have been about people who've left organized religion, specifically stories of people who've left the Mormon church because it's such a in enmeshed uh, religious and cultural and social community that the stories that people tell of leaving the church are like everything is at stake. Not only actual annihilation through death threats from other members of the church, but complete abandonment by the community because if anyone inside were to support someone who leaves, they are in jeopardy. So no one is going to speak up for that person unless they're willing to risk their own position in that community. So there's a complete loss of support and community and identity with that decision. Not, and not to mention any sort of genuine connection to any pieces of the church culture that might have been valuable um, to that person. So I've listened to a lot of those stories. Uh, Mormonstories.org is a great podcast, and um, I just enjoy the thoroughness of it. People, they're very, very long interviews with people that are that have either you know married outside the church, acknowledged um, homosexuality, which is not tolerated by the church, or um, just have decided to leave for personal reasons, you know, questioning their own faith. And it's like, it's so ingrained. It's not just like, oh, let me just go to another church. There's no other, there's no like alternative to the Mormon church. It's like, you're gone. You've got to go to something else or nothing. And um, it's, so it's very similar to me when I read it and listen to the stories. It's so similar to like leaving a culture, you know, an ethnic identity that has so many cultural values embedded in it. It's like, how do you leave it? Like I, you know, I can't, erase my Chineseness on my face, even though inside I've changed a lot. And so have my parents after leaving that culture. But there's, there's, um, it's a, it's a process to really discern and choose what your values are, especially when you realize that some of the culture and some of the values of the culture are abusive or neglecting of people's emotional realities. So yeah, I think I'm complete for today. Um, it's just a really great question to ask yourself. And I, and I also, let me just, I'll just end with this, that there was a period of four to five years out of the last eight that I could not receive or hear the word abuse as it applied to my experience of anything not in the medical training culture, not in my childhood, not in my classical music training. Um, I would, I just have none of it. So I understand that there's just points in time where we're ready to hear certain things <clears throat> and, and, and other points in time when, no, we, we're just not, we're not able to. So um, this is where I am now. And this is Everyday Truth.